there they are. There they are. They're out, they're looking pissed off, they're in the street. They would love nothing more than for me to stop and uh, come flying in through there. I am stopping. Look at it, look at this thing. He doesn't give a shit. Oh yeah, you better run. Good morning. This is Bill from out of Europa, Naples on another muggy Florida Friday. It's like day, who knows, 21 of the whole coronavirus thing. Everything's still sort of shutting down or opening up. Nobody really knows. And I don't know. It's just one of those things that comes along every once in a while. You know, a little thing comes along that shuts down the entire global economy. So uh, we're all putting up with that and trying to move forward. And, uh, you know, I'm trying not to think about it. Uh, I did have to cut down on the medicinal whiskey this morning uh, because I haven't had a horsepower rating that was accurate in like the last three days. So uh, I've, got, I've got to sort of get that figured out. I think I said that the diesel yesterday had like 900. 180 horsepower, uh, basically like a twin turbocharged LS motor from a tuner. So, oh God, I don't know. Um, what I'm going to do today is a very brief history of the um, of the Datsun uh, Z car and uh, a very quick review of my little 300ZX project. Uh, again, just because things are slow, uh, you know, I do have some cars that I could do a video of that are for sale, but. Um, you know, I don't know. They don't really do anything for me, so I figured I'd do this one. And this one is not for sale. Don't call Marty on this car and ask him how much, because he'll be tempted to sell it, and it will annoy me. It will be bad. I, I'm really enjoying having this thing for a little while. Uh, anyway, the uh, history of the uh, Datsun Z car is... Well, it's not very convoluted, but you remember the other day we did the Elante, and I said that the one thing that the Elante was missing was a champion. Uh, it was basically a car by committee. Uh, you know, there was no one guy who really pushed that car through, and it showed in the end result. Not so for the uh, for the Datsun and then Nissan Z cars. Um, what the hell was that guy's name? Uh, Yatuka Katayama. Uh, and we'll call him Mr. K because everyone else does since, you know, uh, Americans have a hard time pronouncing these Japanese names. Uh, but anyway, Mr. K was, uh, he was an executive in the Nissan car company going back into the 1950s uh, and was a rare bird in the Japanese car industry in that he was a true uh, car enthusiast. This is just not something that they had in the high ranks of Nissan at the time. Uh, Nissan was formed as a big conglomerate, a big giant scary conglomerate back in the 1930s and it assumed one of the car companies called DOT, D-A-T, and uh, DOT had been creating a series of you know sort of big cars and trucks and that sort of thing and then came out with a smaller line of cars and trucks which they called DOT Sun, S-O-N with uh, an O in the middle and uh, that was the badge that the cars wore. Uh, then it turned out that Dot Sun had some negative connotations. It meant like to lose money or something. So then that became Dot Sun with a U uh, in uh, respect for the uh, Japanese uh, flag, you know, the rising sun. So uh, Dot Sun became a thing after that. It was built by Nissan. And it carried on and on and on. Uh, you know, they built some cars in the 30s. Uh, into the 40s, they went on a wartime footing. Nissan became even more evil than uh, BMW and Mercedes in terms of their war crimes. In fact, the head of Nissan ended up going to prison for years uh, over his role in some really unpleasant things. You know, the whole... Uh, what do they call that? Pleasure women and whatnot. But uh, anyway, so that, that all, you know, went south. And then after the war, they started building these sort of little, cheap, reliable cars for the Japanese car market. And uh, Katayama, very interesting guy, Mr. K, uh, was in their advertising department. And, you know, he was sort of uh, he just not a guy that everybody loved there. You know, they pushed him wherever he needed to be, but they didn't want him around too much. But he read car enthusiast magazines, and he read about a rally going on in Australia, a 10,000-mile 
Uh, maybe it was a thousand. Either way, it was uh, it was a long rally, and it was a grueling, horrible thing. And he said, you know, we make these little Datsun 210s, which are like little tiny trucks. You know, they're underpowered, they're under-equipped, but they are reliable and rugged as hell. Uh, let's enter them in this race, which uh, he then convinced Nissan to do. And they won. Uh, certainly in their class, they won. And little uh, Mr. K became sort of a national icon although much to the chagrin of Nissan, who didn't want this sort of thing going on. So uh, here they've got this national hero that they really don't want to give too much power to. So what do they do with him? They exile him to the United States uh, in the uh, beginning of the 1960s to sort of develop an idea for bringing Nissan into the U.S. market. They really didn't think it would work. They figured it would fail, and uh, they figured it would be a way to get rid of this guy. So. Instead of, you know, accepting defeat, what he did was get to work. Uh, incredibly motivated guy. He created a dealer network. Uh, he started pumping up the amount of sales that was going on in the United States. Uh, eventually, Nissan rewarded him, again, sort of without much joy, as putting him eh, the first president of Nissan USA. And what he really wanted was a car that could really compete and be substantial in the American market. Uh, enter the Datsun 510. Uh, you know, BMW had come out with this new class, the 1602, uh, and it was a very popular little car. It was a little sedan, little coupe, independent suspension, very high quality. People liked it. It had a nice cult success. And Mr. K decided that he wanted something like that. So he modeled a Datsun after that. This is where it gets a bit convoluted. Nissan had recently acquired another car company called the Prince Motor Company, which was building higher end stuff. It was started by two uh, aircraft uh, designers who had had a hand in making the engine for the Zero. They made an incredible airplane called the Hayabusa in World War II. And they used some of that airplane know-how to create these cars. They were also into racing at the time and had developed some racing motors. Well, their entry into the Nissan Fold uh, gave Mr. K the, the technology and engines he needed to make a car. There is the 510, which came out, and you know, like a clone of sorts of the um, of the BMW. It had four-wheel independent suspension. Uh, it had a Prince-derived overhead cam motor that put out pretty reasonable horsepower, and Americans went absolutely nuts for it. It was a terrific sales success, and uh, you know, enter again, Mr. K decides to get the 510 into the racing world. Uh, gets a guy named Bob Sharp and another guy whose name eludes me, just probably from my morning coronavirus whiskey. And uh, those guys took the 510s to SCCA championships across the country, got Nissan in the news, people became more interested, and uh, Mr. K had the ammunition he needed to make the sports car that he really wanted to make. That would be the Datsun Z car. And, uh, you know, he sort of had this plan to model it off the Jaguar E-Type, a car that he really liked. It would have this long, sleek front end, uh, stubby little tail. Decided to go against the Roadster variant, which, you know, Nissan had been building a few Roadsters, but they were all body-on-frame stuff. Uh, but he thought a two-door, two-seat coupe uh, was something that the Americans would want. Uh, Nissan, again, they were using the name Datsun in America because they thought the whole thing would fail and they didn't want to bring shame to the Nissan name. But they didn't. Uh, so they built this thing. Uh, it debuted in, uh, what was it, 69, 70, 71 in America probably, and was a roaring success. It used a monocoque body, not body on frame. It used an inline six cylinder overhead cam engine derived from uh, the Prince Motor Company, which was, of course, a huge influence on having this sort of uh, technology that would help make a sports car. Four wheel independent suspension. Very well built, very reliable, and America went nuts. It just absolutely wasted all of the stuff it went up against. It ruined the sales of the Porsche 914, the Alfa Romeos, the MGs, uh, all of the stuff that cost more money and wasn't as good. Uh, those sales went to Nissan, and they sold a ton of them ton of them. And uh, there was waiting lists and premiums and, uh, you know, it was a very, very neat time for Mr. K. In 
In fact, uh, Paul Newman, uh, this didn't hurt them at all, got into racing the 510s. Bob Sharp Racing got Paul Newman into racing. He campaigned 510s for a while, and then in 1974 started campaigning a 260Z, and uh, that certainly didn't hurt their uh, their sales credibility at all. Uh, time progressed, and what you know was an incredibly light, lovely, nimble car got heavier and less performance oriented, and more emissions heavy and less powerful as time went on. It was kind of a shame. Uh, all the way up until 1978, uh, they finally, you know, they kept having to bump up the displacement to try to keep up with emissions, but it really didn't work. The cars just became anemic as time went on until you get into 1978 when car and driver said the 280Z uh, was essentially something that Buick would have made if they could, if they wanted to get into a two-seat sports car. Uh, that, that sort of paved the way for these things to become grand touring cars uh, more than light, nimble sports cars. So uh, in 79, the 280ZX came out. Out, and uh, its focus was much less on performance at the track and much more on sort of frilly, fancy gadgets inside, comfortable touring ride. And, uh, you know, again, it, there was no problem with sales. Americans loved them and they bought a bunch of them, uh, but they had ceased to be sports cars. Uh, then, a few years later, out comes this thing. The, uh, this is the Z31 chassis uh, in, the, uh, in the Z lineage. It's the third, uh, third generation Nissan uh, Z car. It was also the first Z, uh, V6, not just in uh, Nissan's history, but in Japan's history. This car had the first V6 that uh, any of them had ever made. Car and driver thought it was but ugly, um, yeah, but America didn't agree, and it was, again, a sales success. 84 saw a ton of these things being sold, and uh, that went all the way through to uh, 1989, uh, when uh, then the Z32 came out, the 300ZX, uh, the next gen, which, you know, was a little more sporty, and many people say that's when Nissan regained their footing on the Z car, and it became much more sporty again. But anyway, there is a brief history of the Z car up to this generation. And now we'll get into this thing. Why the hell did I buy it? I was at a collector car auction in November, and uh, this thing was just sitting there. It was running like crap, smoke pouring out the tailpipes, definitely misfiring. Uh, it had some paint flaws on it, still does. But my heart immediately went out to it. I mean, this is a car of my youth. Again, I graduated high school in 1989, and, you know, this was... <laughs> I won't say it's one of the cars that I lusted after, but it was certainly a contemporary of the time. I found it interesting, and I thought it was very, very cool. Uh, my sister had a 1981 280ZX. My dad liked to spoil her, and uh, she drove that thing for a while. They took off whatever crappy wheels it had. She had a, you know, I've talked about my friend Life. He dated her for a while. And he helped build this Z car from this boring, weird thing it was into something neater. He put wire wheels on it, uh, an ANSA exhaust with no cat. It sounded like a mini Ferrari. Uh, it was sort of a base model like this one, so it had a stick and red velour inside, and the exhaust sounded neat, and it was a two-seater, not the long two-plus-twos. And I just absolutely loved it, and it was one of the cars of my youth that I remember and made a big impact on me. So when I saw this car sitting there, it didn't just invoke the uh, 280ZX in my memory of uh, the 300ZX at the time, but it, it just it reached out to me. It called out to me and said, you know, Bill, you need to own this thing and make something out of it. Uh, anyway, let's just get into it. Let's just get into it. All right, so I've got a few things that I'm doing on this car, and I'll get into them as we go. One thing I really like about it is having a rear wiper. I, I don't know why, but I keep it outside when I go, uh, you know, drive to work. Every, and I sort of really enjoy that I have a rear wiper to wipe the, uh, wipe the mist off. I can't explain it. Just something that appeals to me. But uh, here in the back, okay, now don't... <laughs> I'll get into all this in a minute. Here in the back, I like that it still had these original T-top bags uh, under these weird strap things. And uh, it, again, just something that I enjoyed. The speaker covers, the carpet shrunk a little bit. You can see it's coming off at the sides here, not out as far as it was, but that's to be expected in a car this vintage. Uh, but anyway, uh, there's a bazooka. I'll get into all that in a minute. 
a nice, useful hatch, very proper. And again, I thought it was nice and clean and took me back to a place where I used to be. Uh, under these CDs here, this is the kind of stuff that I loved from Dotson. Uh, you know, look at the way the tools are laid out and inserted and in this weird little heavy thing that can be removed, which it's too heavy for me to do with my left hand. But, uh, you know, the build quality of this car is just incredible. This is really when Nissan was building some amazing things. Oh, that's the hatch I've opened. Look at the, there's the hood. Okay, so under here is the VG30 uh, V6, very popular motor. Uh, now, you know, when I got this thing, it, it had been sitting for a long, long time. So unfortunately, there was a bunch of stuff I had to do to it to make it run right. Uh, we ended up putting on, uh, obviously, plugs and wires, new cap and rotor. Uh, the, hilariously, the distributor, or not the distributor, sorry, the radiator, had essentially corroded away to where it was just, all the cooling fins were gone. It was was just the rows of uh, water lines that were still together and it was working but it just looked creepy so I had to replace it uh, I had an argument with Jason I bought some I, you know they, here's the problem with this car is it is a forgotten car you know when I got it I thought oh my god okay a Nissan Z car you know there's gonna be no shortage of, of stuff for it well man it turned out I might as well have bought a Hispano Suiza or something nothing is available new for this thing or very very few pieces it's just a car that people have forgotten about and uh, as such it's not that easy to source parts so uh, to get an original radiator I either had to go used or pay like 400 bucks for one that was of questionable quality and I didn't want to do either so I bought one that eBay said would fit uh, you can't even see it it's it's really weird how you have to you have to buried under this uh, air box here uh, leaning forward and uh, it didn't quite fit perfectly and as a result Jason had to put in this tapper uh, but uh, I disagree. I think he could have worked at it a little bit more. I think he was anxious to get on uh, his computer and play some kind of dumb video game instead of fooling around with this car. So uh, one of these days I'm going to make him fix that, but I guess not today. Uh, anyway, let's see if I can get my horsepower reading correct. Uh, I believe this had 160 horsepower, maybe 180 foot-pounds of torque, and uh, is enough. You know, it's uh, the turbos obviously had more, and they're more desirable, I hear. Uh, but to me, there's something sort of lovely and pure about the Nasperly aspirated V6. Uh, this car was up north. It was in Ohio. Uh, it's got some corrosion under the hood. That's another one of the reasons that I decided to keep it for myself and play around with it uh, rather than try to, uh, you know, address all of that. Because I don't like selling cars that have any corrosion on them. It's just not our thing. Uh, if I do sell it, I'll probably do it privately. But it's not, you know, it's not lethal corrosion. There's none on any of the bodywork. There's just surface rust underneath. Uh, just enough to discourage me, but not enough to depress me. So uh, it's it's actually fine. Uh, but anyway, with all the stuff we put on, runs like a top, runs great, did a timing belt, water pump, all the stuff it might need, and uh, has become a very smooth running VG30 engine, which, uh, you know, are pretty legendary in the world of Japanese engines. See the AC compressor there, nice cold AC, and a tremendous build quality. Uh, I also love the pop-up headlights, and I like the way that they're sort of half-cocked. Uh, again, this was just stuff that I thought was neat. Let me pop these things up. When I got it, only one popped up. The other one kind of half did, but turned out it just needed exercise. Now, now they both pop up just fine. And uh, I just think that's really, really cool. I also like the way the fog lights work with it. It just has a nice overall, uh, you know, persona going down the road. Uh, by 87, it had gotten a facelift. This is one of the facelift cars. So it got, instead of the sealed beam headlights and fog lights up front under the pop-ups, it's uh, uh, one of those H2004, 8004, whatever the hell it is. It's a proper, more modern bulb. Also, the fog lights got a weird little chunk taken out of them at the bottom, which I think looks neat. You see the big Z badge in the middle. Uh, now, the car had all original paint. That was something that I liked. 
but uh, unfortunately had been subjected to wax or sap or God knows what. So you can see it has all these little spots in the hood, which is a crying shame because again, to see original paint in this condition from 87 is fantastic. If the thing had just had a cover over it or you know, been parked under a tent, it wouldn't have any of this and it would be near mint. So I'm laboring over the thought of whether I paint the hood and bumper or not or leave it the way it is. You know, there's some, uh, there's definitely some benefits to having the paint be original, but uh, by the same token, it's hard to put up with all those little spots. Uh, the wheels, they had started out as sort of these polished aluminum looking things, spun aluminum. Uh, they had all that weird little aluminum corrosion stuff going. And I thought, you know, God, what do I do? I don't put three piece BBSs on it. What kind of period correct wheels can I find? And uh, I went with this. I decided to paint these original 15 inch wheels uh, in this uh, original smoky charcoal color that the 88 turbo 16 inch wheels would have had. Uh, the good news is that the wheels looked identical, uh, same style and design basically for the 15s and 16s. Uh, so I think by painting these wheels charcoal and uh, going with, uh, uh, you know, the original wheels it had, it, it worked out pretty good. Uh, I found an old set of tires that came off of all things, a 560 SL, uh, 205 uh, 60 15s. Original size was 215 60 15, but yeah, I thought, what the hell, these things are free and they've worked out very well. I do love the T-tops on the car, even though I'll never use them because I just feel silly putting myself on display like that. Uh, at the back in this facelift model, uh, they short, they, these things used to be, the taillights used to be the whole width of this back uh, flat there, and now they're just sort of half of it. Uh, you know, maybe it was questionable at the time, but I think it looks good now, and I enjoy it. I also got myself a Datsun license plate frame and uh, did repaint the back bumper, which was pretty crappy, and uh, also the little bumperettes, like the little twice pipes off there at the left. Love the chrome around. I mean, there is a purity to this car that I just really enjoy. And uh, that's, uh, again, one of the things that drew me to it. Uh, you know, these things could be real Japanese Cadillacs. Uh, most of them, in fact, uh, especially if you get into the turbos, were heavily optioned out. Digital everything, power seats, leather everywhere, voice warning systems, uh, you know, all kinds of Knight Rider stuff that was cool at the time, but is questionable now and certainly is not a very reliable setup. Uh, the fact that this was a base model, uh, you know, with cloth seats and a stick and analog gauges. It's something that made me happy and still makes me happy now. Uh, the build quality of the car is phenomenal. I don't think that uh, current cars have the same kind of uh, build quality that this one did. The accountants just wouldn't allow it. Uh, for instance, this little scuff plate here on the entrance is held uh, not just with clips but with screws. I mean GM would never go for that. It would have clips or screws, not both. And uh, that just uh, is the kind of stuff that I think is pretty neat. Also given that almost everything still works in the car, uh, it tells you that these were put together by a people that might have to kill themselves if things didn't go well. Anyway, let's fire it up and get some air going. I did put cocoa mats in it. I absolutely love cocoa mats. One of the first things I ordered for it, because the floor mats were in it, that they just sucked. And uh, I think these look really cool and I'm happy with them. Uh, they're more proper, obviously, in a 60s Porsche or Volkswagen, but yeah, what the hell. If you ever want to have a nice experience, order yourself a set of cocoa mats. I should call them up and do advertising for them. <laughs> I'm such a fan anyway. I do it naturally. So. And get the seat belt on and I'll show you what we got. Some AC going. Alright. Okay, so here we are. Now here, oh god, I've left the hatch open. Oh, for the love of god. And now it's going to crawl forward because we're on it. I'm going to see if I can close the hatch, get the car before it rolls into the, rolls into the dumpsters. I don't know. Again, thinking about a cameraman because everything's so damn hard one-handed, but I'm not sure anyone wants to see my freakish looking mug as they're perusing YouTube. 
Okay, so here is an analog instrument cluster. Uh, very, very neat stuff and very, to me, a weird Nissan. I mean, what kind of car needs? I get digital cars have three odometers. You see that sometimes. Trip on, you know, trip A, trip B, and of course the odometer. But to see that in an analog car is kind of weird and freakish. So uh, it has two different trip odometers and two different fuel gauges. So you've got your main fuel gauge over here, which is great. And then also inside the main fuel gauge is your quarter tank precision fuel gauge uh, that when you get down to that level will uh, show you on a finer scale, uh, you know, how much fuel you have left in the car. And that is the kind of weird dots and stuff that I like. I also make the little pods on the side. I think those are neat. Reminds me of that Berlinetta we did. Uh, the car is a perfect dashboard. And I hate, I mean, I absolutely, it reminds me of something from the Advance Auto Parts, you know, chrome horn section. But in Florida, the sun really destroys dashboards. And I thought, what the hell, I'm going to put this thing on just to protect it. So uh, not my first choice, but, eh, you know, if the car's going to sit around, you better have something like that. I love the way these gauges are angled towards you. Uh, that is a carryover from the original Z car, the original interior, just a bigger, more expensive, less sporty version of it. Uh, it could have digital or analog climate control. This one has digital. Not a big fan of aftermarket radios, but when I got in this thing, it, it had the original factory radio that didn't work. Not the cassette deck, not the radio. It just hissed. Nothing. Tried to find an original radio that worked. I couldn't. I tried to find a company that would fix the original radio couldn't. So I said, screw it. I'm going to go with something that's period correct. Uh, you know, put it in properly so it could be undone. Keep the original radio for a future date and uh, sort of go with that. And then that became a thing. So I found this old Alpine pullout which to me was just fantastic. Took me back to my time in the 80s. Uh, I had a radio like that in high school. Uh, it's got a cassette deck and a CD changer which I mounted back over here behind the seat in kind of a minimalist way. Let's see what we got. And it all works. There we go. We got Ozzy Osbourne going in honor of that bat thing. Love it. So I drive around listening to, um, uh, to Ozzy Osbourne on my old Alpine, and it's fantastic. I uh, also put in a little power antenna thing here so I can make it go back down instead of having it up all the time. Uh, but anyway, if I ever find a proper original radio, I'll probably revert to that. But in the meantime, I've had a little bit of fun doing a period correct system, uh, including that old bazooka that I found on eBay. I haven't got it hooked up yet, just sort of test fitting it. But uh, that should give the uh, drums uh, a little more kick. Um, you know, very nice, simple manual gearbox, nice blue leather, nice fit and finish, nice quality, 300ZX logo up there, got an ashtray and cigarette lighter, all of which still work, the power mirrors still work, um, in here, well, yeah, we got our stuff in there, as you can see, that's a good place for gun storage and ashtray storage, uh, up here you've got, um, eh, you know, a little proper rear view mirror, uh, more fun from the 80s. I decided to put in a passport radar detector like the one I had when I was a kid and uh, There it is up there and you know what the hell so uh, I, I just feel like this is a very comfortable place to be I feel like I fit in this thing and I enjoy it tremendously uh, One thing that's really irking me is the tachometer doesn't work actually drives me batshit, uh, no pun intended again. So I thought, okay, I'm going to buy a cluster. Uh, I'm going to, you know, try and get that tack going. I trace the signal all the way back to the cluster, and it does seem to work. Here's the problem. I search, you know, I, I get this cluster in. I go, I buy the factory service manual. I search online for how to do it. And uh, when it comes to the analog gauge pack in this car, step one of replacing the instrument cluster is removing the dashboard. Like, oh, for the love of God, you got to be friggin' kidding me. You know, to take the dashboard out to fix that is, uh, 
you run into all kinds of crap because, you know, you got the little guy in Japan who would have to do Harry Carry, uh, you know, if the dashboard wasn't bolted in correctly, has put this thing in. So to have some big lug back there, take the dashboard out, reinstall it, I just know that half the screws are going to be left out. It's going to vibrate. Uh, it's just, you know, I don't know. I don't know what to do. So at the moment, I'm just living with it till I figure out how to do it. Uh, I like that the T tops had the. Um, original shade still there even if they've gotten a little bit puffy but you can twist those remove them maybe you can't oh, I got everything one hand what up there's the Sun coming through but uh, there you can see if you want to remove those you have nice overhead glass to uh, <clears throat> you know to let in the night sky or the Sun as the case may be let's go for a spin I also have to do the headliner, that was screwed up. Uh, half of the material was gone, but uh, yeah, we'll get to that. So again, the build quality of this car is phenomenal. The first night I drove it home, I did it on only three brakes because I couldn't find any brake calipers for it, not in the rear anyway. And again, unbelievable, you can't get parts for this forgotten car. I mean, you wanna build a new Berlinetta, you could probably get every part new off the even off the dealer or off one of those sites for the Z car, forget it. This generation, there's just nothing. <laughs> All right, I mean, you know, anemic acceleration, but not ridiculous. I mean, it's enough to, you know. All right, so what the hell was beeping was the card had become full and uh, now I've deleted a couple of things so I can keep going uh, but again you know anemic performance but not horrible it does have four-wheel independent suspension uh, it does um, you know have some sway bars and such and uh, again just it is sort of a lovely pure car to drive the shifter is like butter uh, you know, it's it's not quick, but it's enough to keep up with traffic and you know if you keep it foot to the floor you can have a little fun slicing your way around First I mean, I don't know it's just got this Japanese precision to it that you just don't feel in American cars of the 80s They don't have the same build quality I might even put an exhaust on it so that's it. This is what I've been enjoying. I, I've been driving this around. It's the only car that's gotten me out of that Silverado in two years. Uh, you know, I love the Silverado. I'm just tired and bored of uh, all the German stuff we always have and uh, still want to have cold air conditioning, which of course Datsuns do. So anyway, there it is. This is my little 300 ZX project, you know, not the most desirable of the Z cars, not even close, but I love it. I'm having fun with it, and, uh, you know, I hope you enjoyed watching this. I'm going to keep going on the project. Maybe I'll uh, do an update someday, unlike that diesel wagon. I never <laughs> it got parked in the back and forgotten, forgotten. We just got too many cars to fix. And uh, anyway, maybe as I keep going on this thing, I do a little update down the road, get the tack work and get the radio finished and uh, otherwise keep enjoying myself. So uh, hang in there, you know, do what you can do and uh, we'll see you with the next one. Take care.